coming up on the Wednesday edition of Carolina Week. Going to the North Carolina State Fair, I'm Philip Jones in Raleigh with details that can keep you from getting sick. And I'm Ross Widener in Hillsboro. We'll tell you what this small North Carolina farm is doing in order to survive. And in sports, the women's basketball team won the ACC championship and made it to the NCAA Elite Eight. Will the Heels be just as good this year? Plus a look at your Carolina Week four-day forecast. Carolina Week starts right now. From the School of Journalism and Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, this is Carolina Week. You're watching the October 19th edition of Carolina Week. I'm Lydia Garlico. And I'm Tara Higgerson. The fair is well underway, and this year some important changes are in place to keep you safe. Reporter Philip Jones has more from the fairgrounds. Philip? Well, Tara, when most people come to the State Fair, they think about the Ferris wheel, the great fried foods, and the farm animals. But not many people think about their health. 108 people were infected with E. coli at last year's State Fair after visiting a petting zoo. A new state law has this year's organizers working to prevent that from happening again. Go, 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 go. Let's find a hungry goat, huh? Four-year-old Jillian Perry tried her hand at feeding the animals for the first time at this year's State Fair. And after she finally found a four-legged friend willing to take her treats, she and her mother headed for the newest attraction at the petting zoo, hand washing station. The stations are new at this year's fair thanks to a state law that hit the books this summer. The law requires hand washing stations, educational signs, and fences at any animal exhibition in the state. Jillian's mother, Gabriella Perry, says the measures help her make sure her daughter stays safe. We were real vigilant about making sure she washes her hands as soon as we're done, trying to keep her hands away from her face, trying to make sure she's, you know, a minimum exposure. Parents are taking extra precautions after two-year-old Aiden Gray nearly died when she contracted E. coli at last year's fair. This year's organizers want to ensure that doesn't happen again. Up and down. We're trying to educate all of our fair goers that when you come to the fair, please come in, please pet the animals, but just make sure that you wash your hands when you actually uh, get through petting the animals and particularly before you go eat. That way, no one will leave with any unexpected surprises. And Sarah, so far the new measures seem to be working. State fair officials told me there have been no reports of illness. And are the fences getting in the way of the fun? Actually, no, Tara. You can still get as close to the animals as you could before. Now you just have a little extra peace of mind. And that looks like a lot of fun. Thanks, Philip. Before you go to the fair, here are a few things to keep in mind. The fair runs until October 23rd. Gates are open from 9 a.m. until midnight. And tickets are 6 bucks for adults, 3 for kids. Seniors and children younger than 5 get in for free. And it's not only fair season, it's also flu season. Businesses and organizations have started giving out flu shots, but so far only to those who need it most. High-risk people include the elderly, young children, pregnant women, people with chronic medical conditions, and health care workers who treat patients in long-term care facilities. Vaccinations will be available to everyone October 25th. Nursing Director Carol Kozell says students who don't want to run the risk of falling behind in their schoolwork because they're sick should get the shot. Certainly time away from classes is very stressful and certainly not to be feeling well. Um, the flu symptoms can last for several days and that could be a very hardship on a student in trying to maintain their academic load. Local vaccination clinics on and off campus will operate as long as supplies last. The university is a bit richer, $34.9 million worth to be exact. The National Cancer Institute, or NCI, awarded the money to the Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center. One of only 39 cancer centers designated by the NCI, Lineberger provides a variety of research, patient care, and prevention programs. Inside the center, researchers study DNA and cells to try to find a better way to treat cancer patients. Center officials hope to spark innovation in laboratory and prevention research with the additional funding. One organization that deals with student funding is in search of some additional members. That's right, Lydia. And it might seem like business as usual for Student Congress, but the group's dealing with a stressful situation. Student Congress has held special elections on Tuesday to fill vacant spots in the legislative body. Right now, there are only 23 active members, but there's room for 40 officers. 
Voters in Tuesday's election chose candidates to fill seven spots representing both on and off campus students. While many camp candidates passed out flyers and hung posters, others followed a less traditional route. Candidates like Ms. Seb Moody used electronic sources to increase awareness and encourage people to vote. I'm circulating a very popular site, Facebook, that everyone logs on to. We've had group, um, groups on there as well and had our profiles up with our platforms. People can read that. So I really think the turnout is going to be pretty well this year. Voters logged on to Student Central Tuesday to cast their votes, but results were delayed because of technical difficulties. One thing university officials hope for in those results, a diverse group of representatives. Instead of the segregation we sometimes see on campus, Chancellor Meeser wants to see more multicultural events like this Masala Social. And to do that, he's outlined new goals for UNC. One of these goals, to achieve a clearly defined diversity plan that allows for annual accountability. The Director of Diversity Education and Research, Melvin Newsom, is excited about the possibilities. That what this means is that diversity has now been elevated to a position of importance to the point where now we are actually going to measure it and monitor it, which before it was not. There's no official plan yet, but Newsom says we can expect one soon. The 2005 DPS security report reveals that overall crime on campus continues to fall with larceny still being the most common offense. A new police squad is combating larceny violations on campus this semester. DPS says students can proactively prevent larceny by properly securing bikes and locking cars. Theft of unattended bags is also common. DPS spokesperson Randy Young says campus call boxes make reporting any incident fast and easy. And what we want, really want to um emphasize here is for people uh, to report to us any suspicious activity they see on campus. If they see somebody they're not really fully comfortable with around their residence hall, let us know. Larceny violations fell 43 percent from 2001 to 2004 with 376 total offenses last calendar year. This graphic shows larceny violations reported so far in 2005 month by month, bringing the year to date total to nearly 350. October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Research shows that 30% of Americans know someone who's being abused by her partner, sometimes verbally, sometimes emotionally, sometimes physically. You're likely to know someone who's being abused, though you might not be aware of it. Meet Tanisha Bagley. A few faded photographs are all she has to remember her wedding just more than 10 years ago. We were more or less inseparable. That's the best way to describe us, inseparable. And, um, we just loved each other, nurtured each other, did everything you know we could all the time. But the bride's smile hit a very dark secret. I never would have thought that I would have to deal with abuse from him. But it wasn't until a year after the, we started our relationship, that's when the first hit came. And then from then on, it was downhill. Even when Tanisha gathered the nerve to leave her abusive husband and get a protective order, he still came after her. He wound up hiding in the trunk of my car, and he kidnapped, raped, and sexually assaulted me here in Raleigh back in December of 1998. And that's what landed him in prison for the last six years. She found refuge in a place similar to the Orange County Family Violence Prevention Center here in Chapel Hill. Melissa Radcliffe is the executive director. It's not really a matter of why does someone stay. People's reasons change. Their reason today may be very different from their reason tomorrow. Really what's important is issues of safety. And why would someone who claims to love someone do such horrible things to them? Tanisha's ex-husband is now out of jail, and she has written a book about her experience, which helped her deal with the emotional pain. And this is the smile of a woman who isn't afraid anymore and lives every day to the fullest. Tanisha's ex-husband has registered as a sex offender in Orange County, but he's won visitation rights for his and Tanisha's three children. If you are in an abusive relationship, please go to our website, carolinaweek.org, to find out how to get help. Shifting gears to a lighter topic, just two weeks after Governor Easley signed the School Nutrition Standards Bill into law, Orange County schools are busy implementing the plan. The new law establishes statewide nutrition standards for all school meals, even after school snacks. Students will be able to pick from choices like fruit, whole grains, and salads. And the number of sugary high-fat foods will also be decreased. Legislators hope these small changes will have a big impact on students' long-term health. You'll also find healthier foods on campus now. Fresh on the Move is located in Main Street, Lenore. It offers students a variety of sandwiches, 
salads, and fruit, all freshly made each day. Carolina Dining Services says the program offers highly qualified, healthy food choices for students on the move, and that's good news for junior Josh Horn, who eats on campus six to seven times a week. Between here and my job, I'm always just, it's wherever, I, wherever I've got time to eat, whatever I feel like, grab it and go. The Ram Cafe is also serving up its own healthy dishes. And Lydia, I've tried some of those dishes, some of the salads and some of the sandwiches. They're really good. Also really good is something that is just down the road, not too far away from campus. You can find some homegrown goodness, and it's certainly paying off for a local farmer. And I'm Ross Widener in Hillsboro. While these cows may be cooling off, we'll tell you about one local farm that's hoping the agriculture business won't. These kids are in trouble. They're not getting high on drugs or stealing. If they were, you'd do something about it right now. But why is it almost half of all parents who suspect their child has a problem learning wait a year or more before getting help? Why? Kids with learning disabilities are smart. They just learn differently. Call now. The sooner you get help, the better the chance your kid has. Orange County's population is skyrocketing. It sure is, and reporter Ross Weiner tells us as the North Carolina economy changes because of rapid urbanization, small farms are trying to find a way to keep up. At dawn, time is measured by the changing color of the sky. Every day, the sun rises up over the horizon, and every day, Russ Seibert has mouths to feed. It's breakfast time at Mapleview Farm, and while the older cows take their meal leisurely, Seibert fires up the tractor for the more eager young calves. I think the cows are treated pretty good. <laughs> My wife has said before, if she come back, if she died and come back as something, she'd like to come back as a cow here. Life is good at Mapleview Farm. <laughs> Seibert's routine hasn't changed that much over the years, but his farm's landscape has. Since he bought the farm in 1992, he added a bottling plant and an ice cream store on the hill overlooking the property. I know there was comments made, you know, when it was first being being thought of and started up, was who in the world would put an ice cream store way out in the middle of nowhere, which this isn't the middle of nowhere. The people, uh, you know, we're wearing quite a bit of, there's a lot of people around here. And that's a lot more people than before. While these calves will increase the farm's population by about 26 cows, in the 1990s, North Carolina's population jumps 26%, and what that meant was for small farms like this one, it was either adapt or fade away. Agriculture Economic Development Coordinator for Orange County, Noah Granell, says as the state's economy shifts away from its reliance on agriculture, sleepy country roads are being turned into busy highways. Roads are part of community, and the further you get from curb to curb or ditch to ditch, the less community opportunity you're going to have between those sides of the road. Oh yeah, there's yeah, there's a lot more traffic, um, more bicycles, and more houses along it. I mean, it's definitely uh, becoming more and more um, urbanized. Mapleview Farm weathered the influx of people and housing developments by adding innovations like the new ice cream store in Carver. But North Carolina's population continues to increase. More people keep coming all the time. Um, and we will lose some land that way. People will, you know, farmland will get eaten up. For us, it, it, to me, it means more business. I mean, they're clients, uh, customers. <laughs> so, you know, it's not all bad. They're a shining example of what could be done. And they're a shining example of diversification at the farm level. One thing is certain. The people at Mapleview Farm can expect more change. But for now, whether it's cows or people, Seibert will have plenty of mouths to feed for quite some time. 
The only question is, if the state continues to change, will Mapleview Farm be able to keep up? In Hillsborough, I'm Ross Whitehair, Carolina Week. Business at Mapleview's new store in Carborough hasn't slowed down. As they approach their first winter, they hope seasonal flavors will keep bringing in the customers. People have a new reason to break out their bikes and sneakers. The Metropolitan Planning Organization hopes to see more of these in Chapel Hill and Durham. And Durham. A $2.8 million plan will add sidewalks and bicycle paths to Old Durham Chapel Hill Road, including a 10-foot wide trail at the Blue Cross Blue Shield headquarters. When the project's done, pedestrians and bikers will no longer have to worry about walking on the side of the road or avoiding cars. Senior An Lee thinks officials should implement the plan throughout campus and Chapel Hill. Gas is so expensive nowadays that I think it would be really great if Chapel Hill had uh, more bike trails that we can use because every time I use my bike I feel like I'm, I'm going to get hit by a car. <laughs> Construction won't begin until 2009 or later and it will be the largest project of its kind in the Triangle area. Weathercaster Aaron Wallace is here to talk about the wonderful weather we've been having. And we've heard a little bit about Hurricane Wilma. Are we going to see any effects? We shouldn't, but we're not out of the clear yet. And despite all the beautiful weather in Chapel Hill, there are only a few people outside to enjoy it as fall break begins at Carolina. Wherever you're going, I'll have your complete forecast coming up. I think you should wear a tie. Dad, nobody wears ties to school. Tie says you're serious. It'll make a good impression. And remember, you're there to study, to, study, to, to learn, and to make something of myself. I got it. Almost half of all UNCF students are the first in their family to go to college. They have some great architecture classes. Dad, I'm not really interested in architecture. Well, keep your options open. And remember, no girls until you're until my work is done. done. And I'd make sure that I got my Dad, lunch. Dad, you're not going. I am. I know. Well, listen, you better get going. Don't yeah. want to be late the first day in there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And when you're the first to go, you're going for a lot of people. The United Negro College Fund. A mind is a terrible thing to waste. Hi, and welcome back to Carolina Week. I hope you were able to enjoy the State Fair and the sunshine this week because cloudy skies will be returning to our area, as well as the chance that we could see a rainy weekend at the State Fair as it comes to an end. After the near record breaking highs that we saw on Wednesday and possibly Thursday, our temperatures will be returning back to normal fall like temperatures for this time of year as a cold front moves through our area. So if we take a look at the satellite map, we can see here we've been dealing with high pressure which has been keeping our weather beautiful this week. And it's been clear skies, Carolina blue skies. And back in here we've got a low pressure center that's going to be moving, way, moving its way through our area. And this is also what's going to be pushing Wilma, which is we're just seeing the outer bands of Wilma down here. But it's going to be pushing Wilma uh, across the southern tip of Florida as we head into Saturday. So if we look at the surface map, here's that, here's that low pressure center and that cold front that's going to move into our area. It's going to push out the high pressure that's been dominating our weather. And it's also going to act to move Hurricane Wilma across the southern tip of Florida. Now, right now, it's located right here in between uh, Cuba and the Yucatan Peninsula. But it is scheduled to take a shift to the northeast as that cold front approaches. So let's take a closer look at the uh, Hurricane Wilma. Here she is. She's got a well-defined center, and it has been wobbling quite a bit. Uh, it's only moving west-northwest at 7 miles per hour. Top winds right now are 165 miles per hour, and it is currently 300 miles to the southeast of Cozumel. So, like I said, it's going to move up through and possibly hit farther south of Tampa, anywhere between Tampa and the Florida Keys um, as we head into Saturday. So on the four-day forecast, we'll see no hurricanes in our area for, uh, for the next four days at least. Friday, we're going to see a high of 74 as those clouds roll in and take our temperatures down from the record highs that we've seen on Wednesday and possibly into Thursday. 
Saturday, we're going to see a chance for some showers. It's not going to be a total deluge, but we will see some drizzle throughout the area, depending on where you are in the triangle. On Sunday, the clouds continue to stay around, and we've got a high of 67. Our temperature is going to continue to lower. And on Monday, as the clouds break, our low is going to get into the 40s as we have clearer skies. So if you look at the beach, if you're headed to the beach this weekend, uh, it's going to be a rainy weekend, uh, highs in the mid-70s, low in the 60s. If you're going to the mountains by any chance, the weather should be more nice. Uh, it should be in the low 60s to uh, mid-50s. Um, take a look at the 2005 hurricane season. We've had 21 named storms so far, nine of them tropical storms, and 12 hurricanes, which is unprecedented. So, and uh, as we head into the rest of the hurricane season, we could see uh, an alpha, which would be the first first mm -hmm. time ever. Well, so. hopefully we won't have to make it that far. Thanks, Erin. Yes. All right, thanks. Heather's here with our sports. All right, Carolina's back from a bye week. Are they ready? That's right. Well, our boys are back in action on Saturday, and I'll tell you uh, more about that later on in the show. But first, coming up on Carolina Week Sports, pads are overrated for these guys. More about their rough and tumble sport when we come back. Moorhead Planetarium, where dreams become reality. Change the world. You don't have to be rich, or famous, or play ball, or lead country. All you have to do is tell your family you want to be an orphan donor. Talk to your family about organ donation. Talk to your family about donating life. Welcome to Carolina Week Sports. I'm Heather Catlin. Well, everyone needs a little vacation, and the football team is no exception. Coming off their bye week, the team will host the Virginia Cavaliers. Will the Heels be fired up after a week of rest? Coach Bunting and crew talk about the upcoming game. Uh, we know that we're playing a very difficult opponent. Uh, we need to become a more consistent team, as I've been talking about for weeks. Uh, reduce some of the mistakes and uh, get this run game going a little bit better. Virginia has, has always given us trouble uh, running the ball. So it's going to be important that we, we mix that in uh, with, uh, with our passing game. This is a big game. You know, we haven't beat them in, I think, four years, my four years being here. And uh, we just want to go out and, and prove to our fans that we're a good team. Uh, we need to play at a high level of emotion to play in this game. It's, it's the football mentality that you have to have week in, week out. We have no more breaks. We've got six ACC games, so uh, let's, let's go play one at a time. Kickoff on, is on Saturday at noon, and the Heels look to avenge their 56-24 loss at Virginia last season. The men's soccer team took on William & Mary in Williamsburg Tuesday. The Heels scored three goals in the first 25 minutes. Starter Andre Sherrard um, sat the game out because of a red card he received during the previous game, but that didn't stop the Heels from winning 3-2. Bonding is a part of being on a successful team. Michael Crow tells us for the guys who play Carolina rugby that bonding process is especially important. Ready, 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 ready. Rugby isn't an American sport, but joining Carolina's rugby team has helped United Arab Emirates native Talib al Kaja feel at home in Chapel Hill. I know that like I could just show up and you know like automatically fit in because I played before and stuff like that. So definitely that is, that was a way to add a little aspect of home to the United States. Al Kaja isn't alone. Scotland, England, and the United Arab Emirates are just some of the countries represented by students on the team. Club president David Riddle says the other international students keep him from feeling homesick. I'm not like one Brit in a campus of 20,000. Uh, I'm one of five in a group of 40 now. So that makes it an awful lot easier to stay away from home. These drills have paid off in years past. In addition to being a home to foreign students at UNC, the rugby team has also been a home to champions. 
We've been to nationals a couple of years, two out of the three years that I've, I've competed. Uh, we've picked up the odd trophy here or there for, for the minor, minor tournaments. The rugby team hosted Radford earlier this year. If that match is any indication of how the club will fare this season, the team's in for a successful year. Carolina won 35 to 10. Success brings trophies, but for Brit Sebastian Gibbs, being on the team is more about comfort. It's like sitting in my living room, except you know, a lot more active. But uh, I'm, I'm really comfortable here. Sometimes winning isn't everything. In Chapel Hill, I'm Michael Crow, Carolina Week Sports. The rugby team will head up to Blacksburg, Virginia and face off against Virginia Tech this weekend. Last year, the Lady Heels made it to the Elite Eight, losing to eventual national champion Baylor. Will the Heels be able to do even better this season? Ivory Lotta is the catalyst for the team that ESPN calls the fastest in women's basketball. The team will also rely on Erlena Larkin's inside presence. Last year, Larkin provided an immediate impact by playing tough inside as a freshman. This year's freshman surprise might be Rashonda McCants, who's shown early signs of being able to hit well outside, but also the ability to play tough in the paint. Well, guys, make sure to make it to the game at 12, and uh, four fighter jets will be flying uh, over Keenan. I'll try to make it in time. All right. Thanks, Heather. Thank you. Thank you. And Lydia, you know that the state fair is here. There is no missing it. And with the fair, though, comes lots of food. I'm Sean Maroney at the State Fair, and I'll show you that the food here isn't as bad for you as you might think. back fondly on the years they spent in a parking garage. When we lose a historic place, we lose a part of who we are. Help protect historic places in your community. Visit nationaltrust.org. If you have a story idea, contact Carolina Week at 843-8292. You can also visit us online at carolinaweek.org. If you have questions about this program, Write Carolina Week at Campus Box 3365, UNCCH, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, 27599. Lydia, we all know the fair is famous for its food. <laughs> Maybe we should say infamous. Reporter Sean Maroney got a taste of everything the fair has to offer, and what he found out might surprise you. Fun, good food, corn dogs, candy, funnel cake. Turkey leg. <laughs> Boom! Turkey leg! Turkey leg. <laughs> These words seem to be on everyone's mind at the fair, but does anyone really think about the consequences of all those jumbo turkey legs and monster bags of cotton candy? I try not to. I uh, do a lot of running, so I don't ever worry about it. I just eat and have a good time. I'm a teenager, I can eat whatever I want, really. You walk around the fair long enough, and you'll find plenty of people eager to help you keep tabs on your weight. A turkey leg, two corn dogs, and a fry Twinkie later, I decided to see for myself how much damage I had done. I've been at the fair the last five hours eating everything I can get my hands on. <laughs> what type of damage do you think I'm looking at? Yeah, probably about three pounds. Three pounds? Yeah. So look at me, how much do you think I would weigh? Turn around and look at the camera up there. Well, there's no junk in that trunk. <laughs> We're going to stay with 185. Jump up there. I think you walked it all off. Yep, you did. 175. <laughs> I lost weight. Well, yeah. the damage isn't as bad as I thought, and I sure did have fun along the way. At the North Carolina State Fair in Raleigh, I'm Sean Maroney, Carolina Week. Well, if that's the case, forget exercise. I'm going to go to the fair. But I need to eat what Sean ate. Yes, I'm right behind you. <laughs> All right, that's going to do it for this edition of Carolina Week. Thanks for watching. Have a wonderful evening. <laughs>